we're talking on this program each day about the reason for our existence. That is, we're trying to answer that massive cosmic question, why are you here? Why are you here on the earth? Why is the earth here? Why are all of us here? What's the point of this whole thing? Is it just a tale told by an idiot? Are we just the results of some mindless time plus evolution experience? Or is there any meaning to it all? And of course, we've talked for a long time, you remember some months ago, about the fact that there is great meaning in life itself. That is, there seems to be a great deal of evidence of design and of plan and of conscious, deliberate conception and purpose in our present world. And you remember how we discussed the reasons we have for believing that there has to be some personal mind behind this whole thing. It's the only way in which we can explain the existence of our own personal minds, because we know that this kind of order and intelligence does not come from just chance that it doesn't matter how many parts of a watch you throw into a washing machine and how long you allow that washing machine to turn around, it will never produce an assembled watch that has order and purpose in it. Any kind of order and design in any entity must come from the deliberate planning of some intelligent mind. And then you remember we discussed the question of whether that intelligent mind had ever communicated itself to us. And we examined the various religious men that have claimed to be able to tell us about that mind, and we saw that they all shared the one great limitation, that they were human beings like us, and what did they know that we didn't know? They'd never been off the earth. They'd never been beyond the sky. How could they tell why the world was here? It was like a goldfish inside a goldfish bowl trying to tell how the goldfish bowl came to be there in that spot. And the only person that we discovered in all of the history of mankind that has ever even broken the death barrier, that is, that has died and come to life again and lived here on earth for more than a month and then disappeared completely, and the only person who has ever given us any kind of intellectual assurance that he had actually been able to get off the world and get out into space and be able to understand what is out there is the man Jesus of Nazareth. And so we've been discussing now for a few weeks the explanation he has given us about life itself. And one of the things, of course, that he has brought home to us is that we are all pretty dissatisfied and discontented with our lives. And in fact, most of us are in some way. We all have little satisfactions. We all have little things that we enjoy. But many of us find life very frustrating. We feel deep down that we were made for a kind of perfection, and yet that perfection seems far beyond our reach. Not only perfection of our own behavior, but especially perfection of happiness. We feel we were made for some incredible combination of serenity and of excitement that somehow we feel unable to find. It doesn't matter how exciting the relationships may be that we manage to get into. It doesn't matter how stable our home life may be at times we seem still to fall short of the happiness that we feel we were made for. It's the same with security. I mean, we're all concerned about the economy, and we're all concerned about the way the world's economy is going. But in the midst of it is our own personal economy, and we feel we were made to be free from the anxieties of always trying to get the next dollar or the next pound gathered together. We feel we were made for the stability that at one time we felt when we were little children and had uh, all those problems in our father's and our mother's hands. We feel somehow we were made for that kind of security and stability, and yet the psychologists tell us, oh, you're just being children, you're just trying to get back to your childhood, and yet deep down we feel a bit like the English poet Wordsworth that maybe that is the happiest time, and maybe we were made 
for that kind of stability. And that persists even into old age. We still feel we were made for that. And we feel, of course, that we were made to feel in some way that we are unique. We are unique, actually, but nobody else seems to notice it. And we feel we were made for someone to acknowledge that. And so we try to get that kind of acknowledgement from our wives and our children and from our bosses and our peers. And yet it always seems to fall short of what we feel deep down we were made for. So, Jesus said, you have these great feelings inside you, these great needs, and yet you always seem to find frustration in fulfilling them because you're just flesh, you're just material, and you're trying to fulfill them from material things, from flesh, from things that you can see and touch. And you'll never do it, he said. It doesn't matter how you try. It doesn't matter how many things you get. It doesn't matter how many people think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. It doesn't matter how happy the circumstances are for a while. You'll never get what you really need because what you really need is love and not love of just some other man or woman. What you need is the love of the dear person who is my father. That's what Jesus said. The dear person who made me, who begot me, made you. And he made the world. And he actually loves you. He actually cares about you. And you're made for his love. That's why you're made. You're made for his love. And you feel frustration because you don't experience that love. Because you've tried to find it from the world's love or from the love of other people or from the, the little bit of satisfaction that things bring you or the little bit of excitement that circumstances bring you. You've tried to substitute for that love the things that that love incidentally brings as a byproduct. And so you're trying to go after the byproducts and hope that somehow you'll get the real thing that you need. The real thing you need is the love of the dear person who made this whole world. And that's what you need above everything else. And so when you go after the other things, you're missing them. And what we shared yesterday was, of course, all the best things in life are free. And those are the gifts that your dear creator has given you. Your fingernails, your lips, your teeth, all the things that it takes thousands of dollars or thousands of pounds to substitute man-made items for, those things have been given you by your dear father who loves you. And of course, some of us have kind of begun to grasp that. We've begun to get hold of the idea that there is a supreme being and that he may have a kind of affection for us and he may not be a simply impersonal force or an élan vital or an impersonal evolutionary process or a combination of time plus chance. He may not be those things. He may be what Jesus said he was. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is like me. He has my kind of nature. He has my kind of character. He has my kind of personableness. He has my kind of understanding and love of children. He has my kind of compassion for poor lepers and for Lazarus and for his sisters when he died. My Father is like me. And some of us have begun to think that that might be true because undoubtedly he has made some beautiful things, hasn't he? I mean, have you ever seen a little Yorkshire Terrier lying over on its back and having its tummy tickled? That is quite a sight. Have you ever seen a little baby and smiling at its dad? That is quite a sight. Have you ever seen the first little robin, redbreast? That's quite a sight. Whoever made these things is quite a person, isn't he? Whoever made Danny Kay or whoever made Jerry Lewis or whoever made... Hey, Harry Seacombe, that is quite some person. And that dear person is the one who has made you and made me. That's what Jesus said. He's our father. He's your father. Let's talk a little more about this tomorrow.